Hello and good morning. We're so glad that you can join us today. This morning we are going to be in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, we'll be in Genesis chapter 2. I hope that you join us each and every week and you've got your Bibles close by, perhaps a pen and a pad of paper and you can jot down notes, jot down items of interest that you may want to look up on your own. If you have any questions, you can post those in the comments section of this video. Genesis chapter 2. What is freedom? You know, we just had the 4th of July week uh, this past week, and uh, we've talked a lot about freedom. But what is freedom? You know, you ask the question of 10 people and you'll probably get at least 10 different answers. One person says that freedom is the right to get drunk every weekend. Someone else says that freedom means doing whatever you want whenever you want to do it. To someone else, freedom is sleeping with as many women as possible. And someone else says freedom means making money, living the good life, and having a blast while you do it. But what is freedom? Is it really about money or sex or power? Lots of people seem to think so. And they say that freedom is the right to do what you want. But that concept of freedom is dead wrong. Freedom is not the right to do what you want. It's the power to do what you ought. And that power comes only from God. William Cowper said it this way. He says, He is the free man whom the truth makes free and all are slaves beside. You know, the world declares that man can be successful without God. The Bible says, though, that without God, life even it isn't even worth living. The man of the world pushes God to the side and builds his castles in the sand. The Bible reminds us that sand castles don't last very long because after a while, the tide comes in and washes them away. The world says it takes a man to make a man. But the Bible says it takes God to make a man. Can anyone truly be free? Yes, the Bible also says those whom the Son sets free are free indeed. And everyone else is just a slave, whether they realize it or not. They are slaves to their own passions to the prevailing culture trends, and they are slaves to their own unfulfilled desires. Some are enslaved to money, and they will do anything, and I mean anything, to have more of it. Some are slaves to passion, and they'll indulge in every wild fantasy. There are millions who are slaves to fashion or popularity, or the search for power and prestige and worldly fame. And many are desperate for a meaningful relationship, and they will trade anything for the barest possibility of, lasting, uh, of a lasting human connection. St. Augustine famously said that our hearts are restless until they find our rest in God. And that explains so much that happens around us. The world is filled with restless people who chase after things that they can never find. And if they do find them, they're not satisfied. Genesis chapter 2 reveals to us the secret of true freedom. We were made for God, and without him, we will not we cannot, we will not find happiness or fulfillment or true freedom. 
Now, the text that we're going to read really is all about Adam, but God is really the actor here. He formed man and placed him in the garden, gave him his marching orders, and also gave him one important warning. Now, soon he's going to give Adam a wife. And later he will judge the two of them for their sin. So, who is this story about? On one level, it's Adam. But on a deeper level, it's all about God. Because God is in complete charge here. Nothing happens outside his control. Now, before we jump into the text, I should note one objection that's sometimes offered by liberal critics of the Bible. They allege that the first two chapters of Genesis contain two separate creation stories and that these two stories contradict one another. Now, this attack on the Bible, this particular attack is over 150 years old and it's still popular today. And the answer is really quite simple. There are indeed two creation stories, but they don't contradict one another at all. The difference can be explained this way. Genesis chapter 1 gives us a wide-angle view of creation. I mean, we start in the beginning, and we end up seven days later with the universe, universe perfectly formed. Now, Genesis chapter 2 gives us a telephoto view of the events of day number six when Adam and Eve were created. So think of Genesis chapter one as a panorama and Genesis chapter two as a close-up view and you'll have it just right in your mind. So Moses narrows the focus from creation in general to just one man, Adam because he wants to show us the beginning of the human race. And in chapter 3, we're going to trace the beginnings of sin. And in chapter 4, we're going to look at the beginnings of human civilization. So in essence, Moses is doing what any good storyteller would do. He lays out the big picture, and then he begins to concentrate on the central details of the unfolding drama. Now with that, we turn to the story of Adam's creation by the hand of God. And so in Genesis chapter 2, let's pick up our reading in verse number 4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens... Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now, I want you to notice something very important. It says there in verses 5 and 6 that it had not rained on the earth. And the way that the plants and all of it got watered was, verse 6 says, there was a mist that went up from the earth and it watered the face of the whole ground. Now, that, I don't know what that mist was. I imagine it was something like the dew that we see on the, on the ground as we go out at, uh, in the morning time. Uh, it could be like the fog, you know, that uh, would be forming. Uh, I don't know exactly what it was. But the Bible simply calls it a mist. Now, there was no rain. These verses are one long sentence in the Hebrew language. And the focus has narrowed to one spot on planet Earth. And it focuses on one man, the created man, Adam. The word history, way back in verse 4, 
in the Hebrew, it actually is, is translated generations. And it's a word that appears throughout the book of Genesis. In fact, the book of Genesis is a book of generations. Not only do we read about the descendants of Adam in Genesis chapter 5, but later in Genesis, we read about the descendants of Noah. And then we, later we read about the descendants of Abraham and the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of Jacob and ultimately the descendants of Joseph. Now, evidently, the, uh, you know, the, the climate conditions were radically different before Adam and Eve sinned against God. Again, the Bible says before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb had yet appeared, it evidently refers to cultivated plants that required personal care in order to bring them to harvest. Um, you know, it's not talking about wild plants and wild trees and wild uh, flowers, that sort of thing, but the kind of plants that you would have to physically put in the ground, you would have to cultivate, you would have to pull the weeds, all of that, uh, before all of that took place. Instead of rain, there was this gentle mist that rose from the ground, and it watered the entire earth. Now, verse number seven is critically important to everything that follows. We read that God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, the same way a potter takes a piece of clay and shapes it on a wheel. You know, the Talmud, which, it, it, the, the Talmud was the way that the uh, ancient uh, rabbis used to interpret the scrolls and the history of, of what they read and the writings of, of Moses, and they had their opinions about it, and that's called the Talmud. But the Talmud says that God took dirt from the four corners of the earth so that wherever man goes, he can say, I'm from here. Now, the picture of God shaping the first man, it's tender, it's personal, and it's very intimate. God scooped up some dirt and he began to shape it. Soon there's the outline of a head, the torso, a couple of arms, and a couple of legs. And then the eyes appear, the nose, the lips, and the ears. And each finger is lovingly created by the, the Creator. And every detail of His body is sculpted by the Almighty. And after a while, the work is finished. And Adam is lying on the ground, made from the dust. Every feature is complete. But there's one problem. He is lifeless. And the Hebrew word for man is Adam. And the Hebrew word for ground is Adamah. It's as if God said he will be called earthling because he is taken from the earth. We were made from the dust, and to the dust we one day will return. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Perhaps you've heard the story about the little fellow who one day went to his mother and asked if it were true that we came from dust and we're going to return to dust. And she said, yes, sweetheart, that's true. And he said, well, Mom, I hate to tell you this, but I just looked under my bed and there's someone who is either coming or going. I read an article put out by the Mayo Clinic, I think it was back around 2010, that describes how much the human body would be worth if you just broke it down into its constituent elements. To start with, our bodies are 65% water. But then you add in the trace amounts of iron and phosphorus and sodium and calcium and potassium and magnesium and chlorine and all the rest of the chemicals. And when you figure it up at today's market prices, 
the total comes to about 50 cents. Now, what really floored me was, is that way back in the early 1900s, a scientist used and published his value of the human body at the market rates of his day. You know, in 100 years, we've gained a grand total of 16 cents in value. Now think about that for a moment. You're worth a $5 bill with about 50 cents to spare. I hate to be the one to break it to you, but that chicken dinner that you're going to eat for lunch from KFC is worth more money than you are. See, that's all we are. Water and dirt. Dust in the wind. Dirt man. That's who I am. I mean, just look in the mirror and say this while you're combing your hair tomorrow morning. Look at me. I'm dirt man. You are the son of the dust. Dirt man, son of the dust. You know, that's all we are. And that's why Psalm 103 verse 14 says that God knows how we are formed and he remembers that we are dust. You know, we would do well to remember that in our dealings with one another. No one is made out of super dust. We're all made from the same hunk of dirt. And so we shouldn't be all that surprised when we act like clods. That's all we were in the first place. So you've got Adam here, the first dirt man. He can't stand or move or talk or sing or feel, or think, or even remember. He can't do anything because he's not alive yet. And God bends over and carefully, tenderly, breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And Adam opens his eyes for the first time, and he looks around, and he stands up, and he sees that world that God has made for him. Adam gets his body from the earth, but his life comes from the breath of God. Now, there's a lesson here for all of us, and that important lesson is my value does not lie in my body or in the things that I do or in the places that I go, but my value comes from the life that God gave me. You see, apart from the breath of life, you wouldn't survive even one more second. If God should remove his hand from you or from I, you would cease to exist and our body would quickly return to the dust. You know, we love to boast about what we, might, we have done and what we have accomplished. And we brag about our achievements as if we were somehow immortal. But what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for just a moment and then it vanishes away. We're here today. We're gone tomorrow. The life we have comes from God and he can take it back anytime that he wishes. Look at verse 8 of Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. The Delium and the Onyx Stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hedekel. It is the one which goes towards the re east of, S of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, it's clear from these verses 
that the Garden of Eden is a real place that once existed on the earth. And even though we don't know the exact location, evidently it was destroyed in the flood of Noah's day. But we do know it was somewhere east of Israel, which would place it in ancient Mesopotamia, including the region that we today would call the Fertile Crescent. And that includes much of Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iraq, Iran, and Kuwait. The word Eden means something like beautiful plain. Evidently, it was a vast area in which God planted a garden in one particular part. Now, to be accurate, we should probably speak of the garden in Eden rather than the Garden of Eden. You know, I remember in school how they used to solemnly talk about how that the most ancient of men came from Samaria in Mesopotamia, which lies between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And the implication was man really couldn't come from some Garden of Eden because we don't know where that is. We do know where man came from, and he came from Mesopotamia. Of course, if the powers that be would just simply read Genesis chapter 2, they would discover that Mesopotamia is exactly where the Garden of Eden, uh, it, where God placed that garden, right where that they say that the earliest man could be found between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. That's what I think is so cool about the Bible. All the historians and all the scientists, they're all on this great voyage of discovery. And when they finally find all their answers, they're going to look up and they're going to see all the Bible believers waiting on them. You know, the text is also clear about the incredible natural beauty and fertility of the garden. It was a lush region filled with fruit trees of every variety. And a mighty river flowed out of the garden and divided into four smaller rivers. Two of them are unknown to us, the Pishon and the Gihon. And two still exist that we just mentioned, the Tigris and the Euphrates. In the garden, there was beauty and peace and perfect harmony between the plants and the animals and God. The garden is a picture of earthly perfection. There was no disease, no pain, no suffering, no decay, no erosion, no death. Now please understand something, because this point is crucial to everything that's going to follow. There was nothing wrong with the garden as God created it. Adam was placed into a perfect environment. It's not as if it's a good garden that they, you know, but they still needed to get a few of the kinks worked out. No, this isn't like software where they offer a major upgrade and then have to reissue a patch to fix all the bugs. Everything was perfect right out of the box. God placed Adam in paradise and then gave him a choice. Now, if we're not happy with what happens next, don't blame God. God created the world and he gave us paradise. <laughs> you and I are the ones who turned it into a garbage dump. And this forever puts to rest the popular notion that a bad environment causes crime and if we could just clean up all the slums and all of the, the trash, people would stop doing drugs and stop killing each other and stop robbing the local 7-Eleven. That's foolish because it supposes that the basic problem of life is what's on the outside. So just improve our surroundings and we'll all start acting nicer. Oh boy, I wish that were true. But Genesis chapter 2 conclusively disproves that notion. And if you don't believe me, even after God destroyed the earth in the flood, 
as soon as Noah and his family walked off the ark, guess what? Sin went with them. So you see, it's an interior thing, not an exterior thing. So you've got this man, Adam, who has no sin nature at first. And he's placed in a perfect environment. And still, he eventually makes the choice to sin. And the problem that all of us face isn't out there somewhere. The problem is deep inside the human heart. We sin because we are sinners. We kill because we harbor murderous rage and envy, and malice, and selfish desires. We rob and steal and rape because something has gone wrong inside of us. And until that something gets fixed, changing our scenery is never going to change our basic nature. You know, it's so easy to point at those growing up in gangs and say, well, what do you expect? You can take some rich people and send them to Harvard Business School, give them important jobs, and pay them hundreds of millions of dollars. And what do you get? And you get stuff like Enron. See, it's not the environment, which is why painting the ghettos is never in and of itself going to change society. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm truly in favor of those who have much helping, you know, you know, they've done a lot helping those who have little. And we ought to be concerned about the fact that most of the people in the world live in conditions far worse than we do. It's good and right and biblical to show compassion on the needy. But don't be deceived into thinking that sin is merely some environmental problem. It's not. Sin ultimately is a problem of the human heart. And until we solve the sin problem, crime is going to be with us, even if we all have six-figure salaries, big homes, three-car garages, and lifetime memberships at the local country club. Now, Adam had no reason to complain against God. He was given everything that he needs, and soon he's going to have a wife perfectly suited to him as a friend, a lover, and a helpmate. The only thing God requires is for Adam to be obedient. All the fruit of all the trees, every tree but one, belongs to him. How could Adam throw it away? You know, we need to remember this passage when our life is messed up. God didn't mess it up. We did. God offered us paradise, and we said, no thanks. Now you wonder why you're in the wilderness. It was your own foolish choices. Look at verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So, having placed Adam in the garden, he gives him three commands. First of all, he says, cultivate it. In other words, cultivate the garden, guard it, and the third thing, don't eat from one tree. See, Adam was given the responsibility to cultivate the garden by planting crops. This is the beginning of agriculture on planet Earth. And it teaches us that work is a part of God's plan for all of us. Work is not part of the curse. The toil and the sweat and the struggle that we feel, that is part of the curse. But even in paradise, Adam was given a job to do. He was the senior vice president answering only to the CEO of the universe. God never appointed anyone to sit around all day doing nothing. Work is good and noble 
and part of what it means to be fully human. That's why when we're out of work, we feel abnormal and out of place and slightly unsure of ourselves. And that's perfectly normal. God created us with a natural desire to use our gifts, use our talents to make the world a better place. And then God said, eat from any tree, eat from all of them, except for one particular tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, in thinking about this command, we've got to see it in the proper context. Let's suppose there were one million trees in that garden. So, if that's the, the way that it was, the command really me is the command that God really gave was this: Adam, I've given you. 999,999 trees to enjoy. You can eat a pear, you can have an apple, you can have an orange, you can eat grapefruit, you can have all four if you want. If you want fruit cocktail, you can have it. You want some peach cobbler, it's all yours. How about some fresh coconut milk? Just climb the tree, pick one, and drink till you're full. Maybe you'd like one of those fancy fruit pizzas. Go ahead, indulge yourself. There's bananas, there's grapes, there's all kinds of fruit there. You know, we got strawberries, we got blueberries, we got blackberries. I mean, Adam, there's fruit in this garden that even I haven't had a chance to try yet, but it's all yours. You want nuts, there's walnuts, and almonds, and pecans. Oh, Adam, you haven't lived until you've had pecan pie. And you see that sap coming out of that maple tree? You can make sweet syrup from that sap. Eat from any of the trees or from all the trees. Eat as much as you like, whenever you like. It's all yours, some 999,999 trees. And Adam, see those plants over there? That's called corn. Try the cobs growing on the stock. And those plants there are green beans. And those red things are called tomatoes. And if you dig up those funny looking plants, those are potatoes. Try the onions and the cabbage and the lettuce, but be careful. Those radishes can get a little bit hot. And those horseradishes, well, you should have seen the look on Gabriel's face when I had him try one. We're still laughing about it here in heaven. But remember this, there's one tree you must absolutely avoid. If you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will certainly die. Now that's not a hard command to understand or obey, is it? And it's really not all that restrictive. I mean, the odds are it would have taken Adam years to sample all the fruit, all the trees that were available to him. The possibilities were endless. Now, the point is important because sometimes unbelievers act like God is some cosmic killjoy looking for every opportunity to squeeze the joy out of life. But in this case, God's prohibition is a sign of his love. I mean, you just suppose for a moment that a mother says to her young child, sweetheart, don't drink that poison. If you do, you'll die. Now, is that being unkind? Is that being unfair? No, that commandment is given in love. If she loves her child, she's going to warn him. If she doesn't warn him of potential danger, she doesn't really love him. It's the same way with our Lord. He warns us not to cramp our style. Not, you know, he doesn't do it to cramp our style, but he does it to save us from needless suffering. I imagine Adam, he listened to God tell him all this, 
and he maybe even nodded gravely when he heard the warning. He probably even agreed with the Lord that it would be foolish to eat from that one forbidden tree when there were so many others available to him. And you know the rest of the story. The serpent came along, tempted Eve. She was deceived. She ate, and she gave the fruit to Adam. He ate, and rebellion became a way of life for the whole human race. It's almost as if God walked away, and as soon as he was out of sight, Adam rushed to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he started gorging himself on the forbidden fruit. It's almost as if he couldn't wait. After all, pretty much the first time he is tempted, he gives in without even putting up a fight. And ever since then, we've all been born with a hankering for that same forbidden fruit. We're born craving the fruit that leads to death. We eat it and eat it, and we can't seem to get enough of it. That is why our world is so messed up. We demanded our freedom, and when we did things our way, we ended up suffering the consequences. And then we blame God because everything is so messed up. You see, by eating that fruit, Adam was saying to God, I don't really need you to tell me what to do. I'm smart enough to handle life on my own. See, his act of rebellion was a declaration of independence against the God of the universe. And when Adam ate that fruit, he said, God, you really don't matter. I am the center of my own universe. And the serpent still says today, go ahead. It's okay. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. If you like it, take it. If you don't like it, forget it. Don't let your parents or your friends or your boss or anyone else, don't let the preacher, don't even let God tell you what to do. So the warning from God means this. Live in obedience to me and you will be blessed. Ignore me, and life won't work right, and eventually you'll die. There is one way, and only one way, to be happy and fulfilled. Live under God's control. Stop doing your own thing. Put down your weapons. Stop fighting your Creator. See, until we submit, we're never going to be happy. He sets before us a banquet, all of life, and he says, enjoy what I've given you. Only do not attempt to live without me. You're not going to make it. You can't. Don't think you can survive without me. You see, he offers life, but we must take it on his terms. Now, that leads to some very personal questions for each one of us. How long are we going to insist on having our own way? Are we still fighting against the God who created us? Have we stopped trying to be little gods? <laughs> are we ready to bow before him, or must the fight go on a little longer? Have we crowned Jesus as Savior and Lord in our own lives? Are we willing to live on God's terms? Or do we still think we can make up our own rules? Oh, dirt man, what do you say? Son of the dust, do you know where you're going? Did you think you were going to live forever? Did you think you were never going to die how wrong you are. From the dust you came to the dust you shall return. What's going to happen to you then? See, our only hope is in the Lord. How weak we are without him. Let every person listening to my words today resolve in your heart to come to Jesus. 
run to the cross. Lay all your sins on Jesus. Trust Jesus for salvation. From the dust we came, to the dust we shall return. But through Jesus, we can live forever. May God help us to trust in him and find salvation that takes us from the dust of the earth to the glory of heaven. Let's pray together. Father, how much we need the, the truth of your word to teach us our true condition. Without you, we are but little clumps of dirt. And forgive us for thinking that we were ever anything else. Truly, we are here today and we're gone tomorrow. And after that, we are so quickly forgotten. Thank you for Jesus who came that we might have abundant life and come to know you. Jesus, we crown you King of Kings and Lord of Lords in our life. Father, we pray that you would be with us and help us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. This coming Sunday, we are continuing our series out of the Old Testament Book of Psalms. Now, beginning the first Sunday of August, we are beginning a brand new series on the names of God that we find in the Old Testament. Uh, we discover that there are a number of names that God used in and of himself. Names like El and Elion and Elohim and Jehovah. And uh, also there are some other words like Jehovah Jireh and Jehovah Rapha. Those are names that describe the characteristics of God. And so beginning in August, we are going to pick up and we're going to study a few of those names for a few, uh, about three months there. Also, beginning in August, we are going to begin a 31 days of prayer, and we're going to invite you to pray those names of God with us during that time those 31 days of August. So we hope that you can join us and be with us. Next Wednesday, we continue our live online Bible study on the book of Genesis. That's Wednesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. live on Facebook. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.